integrating OER into instructional initiatives. And as uh, one of the co-authors in K-12 Voices for Open, as well as facilitating the Go Open Network, I'm really happy to welcome you to this session and we're excited to be sharing. If you, uh, if you like, you can use the chat during, uh, during the session to uh, first to put your, your name and if you're comfortable where you're located, your affiliation, your geographic location, we'd love to see who's here and uh, we'll be introducing ourselves as well in a sec. First, I'm gonna just give you a quick overview. Uh, we'll do our introductions and then we're going, going to just describe and define some of the terms and acronyms that you're here, you'll hear today. You may be new to OER or the network uh, or maybe very uh, uh, experienced in this space, but we, we love to create uh, a shared understanding as we launch in. We'll walk through the strategic action guide and those materials that uh, we've created uh, around OER uh, in, in implementation. And uh, we'll put a spotlight, especially on the work that's being done in Pennsylvania. And then we'll have some time to reflect, discuss, and, and hear any questions that you might have. So why don't we do a round of quick introductions? I'll pass it to you first, Becky, and we can just go in order. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. My name is Becky Henderson. I am the Curriculum Services Supervisor at Westmoreland Intermediate Unit in Pennsylvania. And I am Tracy Raines. I am a Virtual Learning Specialist with Appalachia Intermediate Unit 8 in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Hi all, I'm Kelly Hammond, an OER and Open Pedagogy adjunct at the CUNY School of Professional Studies in New York. And I'm Amy Evans Godwin in California. I'm senior advisor at ISCME and a global nonprofit. And we are focused on making learning environments and knowledge sharing more participatory, equitable, and open. We run the OER Commons digital library and collaboration environment. And we have been also uh, working with um, the Go Open Network for five years now and uh, in its transition to being community led, which we'll tell you a bit about today. We're defining the Go Open Network as um, a community of educators and leaders like yourself who are really looking at supporting K 12 open education and uh, through knowledge sharing collaboration and, and looking to benefit learning, teaching and learning overall in the broader sense. Uh, you may recall that the Go Open Network was a federal initiative for about six years under the office of Ed Tech and Department of Education. And uh, they helped to promote open education among member states and districts. And what we've done over the last uh, year or so since uh, 2022, when it became a community-led initiative was to uh, remove any barriers to entry that anyone can join the network as an individual. There's no uh, requirements for states and districts to comply with specifically. And with that membership model, we're really looking to diversify the participation across uh, the K-12 environment and working with uh, partners like CAST and Foresight Law and Policy and a steering committee of leaders, we've been developing uh, professional learning opportunities like this webinar series and policy actions that are looking to impact the wider K-12 education ecosystem um, broadly. So our goal is to um, ad advance and support participation. And we created the Go Open Hub at the end of last year on OER Commons. So you can join the network there. You can join the hub 
and the groups that are there in order to find more people in the network and also search for resources that have been specifically curated for the, for the network. Now, if you're, if you're new to OER, we just want to also emphasize some of the, the benefits that we'll be covering today and, and things that really have motivated us to create this guide. For, for something to be truly open and to be defined as OER, it should be open licensed. And that means that the creator of the material has put permissions to allow that material to be accessed and adapted and reshared without having to ask special permission to do that. Or the, or the materials are in the public domain, which there are no restrictions. We want materials to be freely available. So that includes being able to access it online uh, with no fees attached, without being behind a firewall or other things that restrict access. And also more broadly, can materials meet the demands of accessibility so that materials can be used by all learners, including those with disabilities. Modifiable, uh, we want a resource to be uh, clearly editable. It, ideally, it's made accessible in an editable format and shareable that it's been licensed for resharing and redistribution after modifications to really help keeping materials updated and contextualized. And that's really what the the freedom around OER uh, denotes. And for the benefits, uh, we've really seen over time, uh, OER has been around now for two decades, and there's, there's a host of benefits for educators that take it on. That through OER, we see that educators can more easily customize their resources to meet their students' needs. They can design them, uh, at the start using universal design for learning guidelines, for instance, um, make them more equitably ac accessible and usable. And through that customization and contextualization, educators become more invested in materials and more familiar with the standards that they're trying to teach. And as a result, for students, they see themselves reflected in materials potentially and are more engaged. Now the K-12 Voices for Open Community has been uh, a, a community of practice since around 2020, 2021. Uh, we began with a series of discussions and formed this community uh, in 2021. And in 2022, we really saw that there was a call for more support for K-12 district cohorts, leaders, and implementers to have structure around building a comprehensive way of integrating OER with what they were already doing. And that's one of the, the points we'll really emphasize today, how important it is to see OER not necessarily as something new and uh, you know has to you know change what you are already doing. It's really meant to to fit and be an accompaniment to the strategies that districts are taking on. Uh, with K twelve Voices for Open, we started with uh, articulating a um, a statement and commitment to diversity, equity inclusion and accessibility. And we'll hear a little bit more from that. And we advocated that districts could use federal funding to support OER rather than uh, on buying more uh, proprietary materials that investing in teachers is really another key point for today. So in creating the guide, we had uh, a process of looking at the definitions, doing a lot of research, finding what resources might already be out there, and doing an iterative writing process. We see the guide uh, as a strategic planning tool for district leaders to promote what's already ped pedagogically and financially a compelling practice of using OER and help districts uh, do this strategically and with DEIA in mind. 
Uh, so there's a lot of um, modules and templates within the guide that we'll be looking at today. So why did I pass it now to you, Kelly, uh, on this term, DEIA, and tell us uh, the framing around that? Great, thank you, Amy. Uh, and as you just mentioned, Amy, because OER can be adapted by teachers, they are such powerful tools for our DEIA goals. Hopefully your district already has defined some key values similar to those that are on this slide. But we've included expanded definitions of the terms we use in our guide so that districts who feel that terminology can sometimes get in the way can focus on the DEIA outcomes rather than the terms themselves. So we're just going to take a moment right now just to review our definitions so that we can set our sights on and bask in the ultimate goal of the guide, which is broader engagement, access, and success for every student through OER. Regarding diversity, in the guide, we focus on the fact that all students need to see, read about, and hear diverse people's voices and experiences throughout the curriculum. A diverse curriculum not only shows a wide range of students, um, allows a wide range of students to connect with the content and see themselves reflected as contributors, as Amy just mentioned, but it also provides a more accurate representation of the world that all students will encounter in their lives, whether in person or in the media. Regarding equity, in the guide, we make the distinction between equality, where everyone is treated identically, to equity, which is about providing everyone with the specific things they need to achieve the same outcomes as others. Uh, one example is providing a group of students with the exact same worksheet distributes the materials equally to each student. However, providing the worksheet in Spanish or in a screen readable format distributes the worksheet more equitably to all, including Spanish speaking ESL students or those with visual disabilities. Inclusion is about involvement. Inclusion at, inclusion at its best provides students with a real sense of belonging, that they're welcomed and heard and that their experiences and perspectives are respected and valued. And for those of you who are classroom teachers like me, um, you know that that feeling of inclusion is absolutely essential when it comes to the practice and performance of transferable skills. Students who feel included are far more willing to risk the failure that's so critical to meaningful learning, and they are more willing to receive and apply the feedback that's so essential to growth. And finally, in terms of accessibility, we all know that a host of barriers can block access to learning financial, linguistic, developmental, cultural, physical barriers. And an accessible curriculum is designed with a range of learners in mind, that universal design that uh, Amy mentioned. So this may mean providing a reading in more than one language or in more than one reading level to allow students to access the materials. This also may mean digitizing or the converse, printing materials to make them accessible to students with visual impairments or those without internet access. And because OER can be uh, altered, we can provide much more comfortably, we can take materials and adjust them for our students along these um, DEIA goals. As we leverage OER to reach these goals, we remind ourselves of the old adage that what's essential for some is beneficial for all. And we hope that you'll embrace that spirit as you look at the guide as well. Um, and we also wanted to mention that in our work, we also recognize our own positionality. Uh, you know, we recognize that our identities and our experiences uh, on our team have shaped this work. And we're so, so hoping that you will share your adaptations of our guide to broaden further its utility uh, for a wide range of districts. And with that, I believe I'm turning it over to Becky. Thanks, Kelly. And that was so beautifully stated. Thank you for adding that. Um, Amy, if you don't mind going to the next slide, what we want to do is talk a little bit about the guide itself. So this slide for everybody has a QR code and a link directly to the guide where it lives on the Go Open Hub. So if you want to take a moment and scan that QR code, you're more than welcome to go ahead and check it out and start to dig into it. Um, I just wanna frame this for everyone before we move into the next few slides. We are going to present 
the sections of the guide for you in three different formats. There's going to be a visual display for you. Then we're going to break it down so that you can see the definition and the intention behind each of those sections. And thank you, Kelly, for dropping that link in the chat as well. And then we are also going to put it in a chart format where we can help to identify the way that each of those sections may align to current initiatives and current actions that you're doing within your district right now. The intention of some of these very text heavy slides is not for you to read them right now during our presentation. It is just informational and you're going to get this slide deck as a resource. So we wanted to make sure you have it. I'm going to talk over quite a bit of it. So please do not feel overwhelmed by the amount of information that is on the screen or that is going to be on the screen. We just wanted to display it in a couple different ways for you. So let's go ahead and go into the next section. So there are eight components to the guide. Um, and I am very much a proponent of continuous improvement cycles. So I like to think in a very cyclical manner here. So those eight components are goals and success metrics, core team and roles, actions and timelines, collaboration plan, funding plan, advocacy plan, educator and staff professional learning plan, and infrastructure and support. For those of you that know me, I at one point in time was a music teacher and I always joke that my uh, math skills only go up to eight. Um, and I always think of things in a circle because that's kind of how <laughs> we work in, in music. Um, so yesterday when we were kind of working through this, there was a, a little background joke that why does this start at eight? Eight doesn't start at the top. Uh, in music, it kind of does sometimes. So if you're wondering why we have it structured that way, it's just the music educator in me that kind of came out a little bit. Um, but also it reinforces that cycle that you don't have to start at one specific point when you're working through the guide. Although we do have it in a specific order, it's just the order that we put it in. This guide is really able to be personalized for your individual district. So you can take it in any order that you want. You can use the entire guide. You can use components of it. Whatever you feel is most meaningful for you at any given point, you can start with infrastructure and support. You can start by focusing on your collaboration plan. If you want to focus on your timeline first or goals and success metrics first, that's fine. Wherever you see it needing to start for your individual district, it's fine. The point is that it's going to be continuously worked on and all of the elements will coincide with other things that you're working on. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. The next slide is gonna just kind of break down some of these elements for you. Each of the definitions that you see here, and I broke this down into two slides um, so that you can see each of them a little bit uh, more clearly. Each of these definitions for the sections are pulled directly from the guide. All of this language is right from there, just helping you to understand the purpose behind each of the sections. We wanted you to really understand that we didn't put anything in arbitrarily, but every single section that you see within the guide is going to relate to your work. In K-12 education, we are always thinking about goals and success metrics. We're always determining what our next step is. We're always determining the people that we need on a team for any given initiative. We always have timelines if you're involved in comprehensive planning, school improvement planning. There are timelines involved in that. Everything that's in this guide was done from the lens of what are K-12 educators and K-12 leaders thinking about right now and how will this fit in? If you go to the second slide, the next one, you'll see that we're talking about funding and advocacy and professional learning and infrastructure and support. Again, things that you need to consider as you're continuing to work towards your ultimate vision and mission as a district. So we wanted to make sure one more time that everything that you do all connects to each other. I know I keep saying that, but it is really important for us to reiterate and Tracy's laughing at me a little bit. It's okay. We do that a lot. Um, but it's important for me to reiterate the fact that everything that we do 
is not siloed off in our OER DEIA work. In fact, it integrates with everything else. So here's where it integrates. Um, this is not comprehensive. This is not the be all end all, but this chart kind of gives you an idea of where each of the components within the plan may fit into the work that you're already doing. So if you're looking at goals and success metrics, you're going to find that that might help you as you're working through district policies, curriculum reviews, looking at your vendor approval process, going through data analysis, things like that. If you skip down to action and timelines, again, you'll see some overlap. District policy shows up again. If you're in the process of rewriting your mission statement or updating your vision statement, putting a project plan together, determining your annual goals and plans for staff, if you're going through a needs assessment, things like that, they all align together. And those tools, the templates that are within the guide may help you to move forward on the work that you're currently doing. If we take a look at the next slide, again, you have some more examples of where to go with funding plans, advocacy plans, your educator and staff professional learning plan. And we're going to do a bit of a deep dive on that one in just a little bit, because that's the one I think sometimes that tends to fall by the wayside a bit when it comes to OER and DEIA, and then your infrastructure and support. Again, you see comprehensive planning, your school improvement plan, digital equity plans, anything that you need to do to support students and help them to be successful, anything that you are doing that becomes a state initiative, a state mandate, a federal mandate, this action planning guide can help you to support that work. So let's take a look at this through the lens of Pennsylvania. PAIU, the Pennsylvania Association of Intermediate Units, is our umbrella organization for the 29 intermediate units that are across the state. In Pennsylvania, we have 500 individual school districts, and we have 29 regional education service agencies known as intermediate units. Tracy and I work for two different intermediate units. She is IU8, I am IU7, Westmoreland Intermediate Unit and Appalachia Intermediate Unit. Um, and just and for an example, my <laughs> intermediate unit covers 35 districts in 50 non-pubs. <laughs> so we cover a lot. And, and Becky, how many does yours cover? I have 17 districts and 42 non-public schools. Yes. So every intermediate unit has a variety of public schools, non-public schools. Some of our intermediate units have multiple counties within their regions. Some are one county. In my case, we have one county, Westmoreland County, which is southwestern Pennsylvania, um, closer to Pittsburgh. So PAIU, our umbrella organization, really helps to drive what our work is in promoting educational and operational collaboration across the state. We get a lot of our work sort of um, guided by Pennsylvania Department of Education, but PAIU collaborates very closely with PDE and how we do that. And we really try to be innovative in our work. We are much closer in the hierarchy of <laughs> where all of the educators are in, in Pennsylvania. We are much closer to teachers and school leaders just because of proximity than PDE is. So it's easier for us to help them implement state mandates, federal mandates, just because of where we are. So some of the innovations that have come out of PAU, one of the biggest ones is our PAIU hub that's on OER Commons. And that was actually established in 2017. We also have a lead on podcast with Greg and Mark, two of our executive directors at two of our intermediate units. And then Pete and C, which is our Pennsylvania Educational Technology Expo. This is our entry point into OER. It started in 2015, where we had two districts from Pennsylvania become ambassador districts for the Federal Go Open initiative. Um, out of that work, several districts started becoming very curious about this thing called OER. And they came to their intermediate units and said, help us figure this out. 
Within our PAIU structure, we all have job alike groups. And one of them is called PAMES, which is the Pennsylvania Instructional Media Specialists. This is one of the groups that Tracy and I belong to. It's actually where we met and became very fast friends. And within that group, um, PAMES became the group that said, hey, we want to talk to ISKME about creating a hub on OER Commons. So Tracy and I are the ones that really now help to spearhead that work, make sure that the hub is up and running, and we are the ones that help to keep the OER conversation going across the state. It is very much a grassroots movement. Again, 500 districts means 500 different approaches to how things work. And that's fine with us because we want this to be something that is personal to each of our districts. As our work has continued, um, one of our favorite things to showcase is what's called the PA STEM Toolkit, which has been a statewide collaboration of educators and IU leaders to build a collection of STEM-related resources, which has become very timely in that we now have new state standards for science. They're called the STEEL standards. So the PA STEM Toolkit has been featured very widely recently. And now we also have some new culturally relevant sustaining education guidelines and frameworks that have been released that are going to go into effect next school year. And because of that, the OER DEIA action plan for K-12 district implementation is one way that we're helping to talk to our districts about OER implementation in their school because it helps to align to this framework that they are now being required to implement in their classrooms. So when we talk about the guide in PA, we like to align language to our districts, again, as closely to the language that they're already hearing from the state, because we don't want to overwhelm our districts. We don't want them to think of this as a separate initiative or one more thing that they need to think about. We want to connect it to the nine categories of instruction that PDE already talks about with them that's already in their heads. So you can see on the slide here, that these are the nine categories that PDE tends to think about when they talk about instruction with educators at the K-12 level. And that's assessment and accountability, career and technical education, career ready, curriculum, federal programs, safe schools, school services, special education, and STEM. And we found in our work that the OER DEIA guide really fits the bill for discussions in all of these fields. In addition, if you go to the next slide, you're also going to see that it really fits the bill for discussions when we talk about their cycle of continuous improvement. In Pennsylvania, we engage in comprehensive planning every year or every three years. It's a three-year cycle for our districts. We also have to engage in school improvement plans for annual meaning differentiation, which is part of our ESSA federal requirements. Um, I know many people on this call are familiar with the idea of not meeting or meeting federal guidelines for accountability. So we're talking about our state mandated tests. We're talking about attendance. We're talking about graduation rates. And if you don't hit those benchmarks, you get put into school improvement categories. And I have our categories listed here. We have a school district logo here, Greensburg Salem School District, which is in Greensburg um, in my territory. And Greensburg Salem is a great example of a school district in Pennsylvania that has actually used OER to help foster a brand new culture of thinking about instruction. They have actually embedded OER into their comprehensive planning cycle. So they talk about using OER now as part of their instruction constantly. They have it written into their comprehensive plan. They also have it built into their ATSI plan for school improvement. So as they go through, they are taking what they've learned over the years about the importance of OER, the flexibility, the way they can help to personalize this for their student population. And they are saying, this really works for us. This is helping us to empower teachers. This is helping us to empower students. And they are always intentionally building plans around the fact that they want to use OER as part of their instructional practices. 
now that the guide exists, they have tools and templates that they can use to actually help it be much more organized than it has in the past. Not that it's been poorly done at all. It has not. But now they have concrete tools that they can use as well to further their practice. In addition, this is something that can also be embedded into technical assistance plans and accelerated learning plans. So that's just one school that's been doing some great work of, when it comes to OER in Pennsylvania. And I know we have another district we're gonna feature later. We're gonna transition now to talk a little bit about the educator and staff professional learning plan and how we've been approaching that. And I am gonna pass it over to Tracy for this. Hi, thank you, Becky. Um, so here, once again, we have the link in the QR code to the staff educator and staff professional learning plan. If you want to take a minute to grab that link or connect to that um, QR code, we'll give you a second for that. Thank you again, Kelly, for putting that in the chat. <laughs> yes, we appreciate it. And I could okay. pop right over to it as well. So. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to go back to the to the original slide deck first? Would, would you like the next slide? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. So when implementing this kind of a new initiative, as it has been mentioned, I think by everybody, um, the importance of taking the time to make the connection on how this will align with and support other initiatives that are currently in progress. So for example, in one of the schools that Becky was talking about highlighting is Garnet Valley. It's a Pennsylvania school that had already been implementing um, universal by design initiative. And if you you can't, I know it's hard to see the, the numbers and what that says, but basically that mustard yellow color um, shows how much they were spending on textbooks. And then the light blue at the bottom is how much they were putting into their initiative of UBD. So throughout the years, they decided that they were going to reallocate those funds into empowering their teachers and creating OERs. Um, and so at, you can see through the years, the difference in the um, allocation of funds and the purple is the professional learning, which is a humongous, and as Becky pointed out, often overlooked how big of an uh, undertaking it is and how important it is when, when trying to teach and, and and switch to the OER initiative. Um, as you see, that dark blue on the last 2018, 2019 is OER. And I, as you've seen with a lot of our stuff, it stops at 2019 and then starts again at 2023. Um, I did, I have gone in and I have looked and they are continuing to support an OER initiative. Um, as of the spring of 2022, um, their district says that they rely on open education resources to flexibly and effectively meet the needs of all learners, and that the teachers use their professional expertise and work collaborati collaboratively to select materials for the classroom. Um, Becky and I talk all the time about the fact that the, the teachers are the experts and we, we need to rely on them a lot more. Um, and one of the one of the really big parts about Garnet Valley is that once they started this OER initiative, they then ended up changing administration and getting a new superintendent. And so the initiative received so much buy-in from the empowerment of the teachers that it continued even with an administrative change, which we know doesn't always seem to be the case. So once the initiative is created and started, one of the next very important things to do is a needs assessment. It's really important because every district and every school and every teacher in every building is going to be at a different level when, it, when you start an initiative like this. Um, we have, 
we have teachers that follow copyright as a, a rule of law and we have teachers i have done a, a professional training um where a teacher said steal 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 <laughs> and that's what they learned and i and so it's really important that we make sure that we understand where each teacher is these are just a few questions from the guide to help assist with a needs assessment however every school is going to be different so if you have teachers that already are 100 percent into teachers isn't a great resource then maybe you can skip on through and, and ask some different questions when you do your needs assessment um so another example when we talk about the needs assessment and the different needs of each districts as becky said in the in the pennsylvania world here we go. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have Garnet Valley who started with social studies department because, you know, they, they said, absolutely, we want to go with OER for all of our non-tested subject areas. <laughs> and then we have some schools Becky, I believe Greensburg Salem was one of them that said, absolutely, we want to do OER with all of our tested subject areas. So most of the time, there is kind of a divide there. Most a lot of schools are more comfortable going into OER with the non tested subjects, which which we understand. Every implementation is going to be different. And, and we know that, and once the needs assessment is complete, Becky, if you wanna to go to the next slide, do you want to, can you put that in present mode so it is a little bigger? Yep, sorry about that. That's okay. There we go, okay. So once the needs assessment is complete, the guide offers a lot of really great resources that you can use in order to get started. Again, get getting started where your teachers need to be. So one of the resources that I have included in this guide is an OER starter kit, which is fantastic. And a lot of what you will see in the guide, I have a table in there, and it shows um, basically what that starter kit, it has the same kind of table of contents layout. Um, However, in the OER guide that, that we're discussing, it also gives a lot more additional resources. So in this, we have a teacher's guide to copyright and fair use. Um, and in the guide, there are some additional resources there. I myself believe that the copyright is a huge, huge component that's necessary when discussing professional learning with the teachers. Um, Creative Commons is a wonderful website to get started on. Um, I always say, you know, as teachers, we don't allow our students to plagiarize. And as teachers, we should know the rules of the resources that we're using also. So I really, really can't stress enough the importance of understanding that copyright and fair use. Um, but then building a foundational understanding of the DEIA. There's a couple different resources in there that, that follow along the DEIA. Um, four principles uh, for universal design for learning approach. I don't know what instructional strategies or what approaches you are using. Uh, UDL is a huge one right now. And so we have some resources available for that. And in Pennsylvania, we have identified competencies and developed standards for educator training in culturally relevant and sustaining education framework. Um, so I, I have that listed in there also, just to further embrace the diversity in content and practices. All right. Great. Frank, thank you so much, Becky and Tracy. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so proud of Pennsylvania for doing this work and how long that you've been doing it with such uh, comprehensive commitment and, and strategic thinking. 
So I just want to open it up to our participants. Uh, you can unmute yourself or, or ask to be unmuted. Um, I'll try to unmute everyone. Uh, is there something surprising that you see in the guide? Something that might be particularly useful in your context or, or questions that you have? Something that uh, is coming up for how it might be implemented in your context or something that you have tried regarding um, structuring an OER initiative. And if you're shy, you can put your questions and comments in the chat. It's fine. Hey, I'll go. This is Yvette. <clears throat> I have a couple of quick questions, but I'm looking at your questions. What is something that is surprising for you? Um, I'm not, I don't know if I'd use the word surprising, but I just really like the comprehensive nature of the guide that resonates with me, um, how it encompasses all the important aspects of um, OER. Um, the getting started um, part of the guide really stood out because we see a lot of getting started in different areas and in different states and so forth. But I like how they have compacted, embraced that, that getting started here. I also, really like, also like the culturally relevant piece that's part of the guide as well. I think that is so important. And um, just so much about the guy that I re really like. So I wouldn't say it's surprising, but definitely encouraging and, and it's something to consider. Um, what might be most useful in your classroom or context? <laughs> what will be most useful for me is also part of this third, the third question, is it, which is what might be the most challenging in your district? Um, and building a system of support, which is the mindset, shifting the mindset away from textbooks, textbooks, textbooks. It's a really colorful um, chart there, bar graph there, where um, it dwindled so much from that brightly colored color, that bright color that represented the textbook adoption um, to where more OER resources were um, um, embraced. But for me, there's still that challenge of shifting the mindset to embrace something of that nature. And uh, it's still a struggle for me. Thank so, you, Yvette. I know that um, your environment, uh, likewise uh, with Pennsylvania, has been addressing culturally relevant education and um, and probably meeting many of the challenges there. So I re really appreciate your comment. So I will say too, um, one of the things that I try to use as a resource in order to get over the textbook situation is um, CK12 and OpenStax because that mm -hmm. still gives the opportunity of having a you know a text that they like to hang on to but it is in an open education resource format so that is kind of what I've been trying to use to to help people you know give them a little crutch on their way towards using OER and getting away from the textbook okay and I would add to that. Oh, I was just going to say, Amy, you had on one of the earlier slides um, the Open Yop, uh, the American Yop textbook, which is a yeah. great. It's what it's what we always wished a text could could be. It's a collaboration of over three hundred historians with ancillary materials. It's an OER um, American history textbook for high school and and um, and college, but. What I love about it is the links to improve the text and the fact that they make additions every single year. So things that, for example, I've always noticed there's a little um, lack of AAPI history. And so I've requested that they add to that. So in addition to educators being able to alter the text, 
the fact that the historians are willing to alter the text is pretty exciting as well. And that's a great model for people who are a little nervous about potentially the quality or the use of OER. Thank you for that, Kelly. Yeah, uh, OER, the movement is has certainly been about a change of mindset and changing what we mean by textbooks, redefining what's meant by textbooks and resources to be something that's continually updated, continually improved, and fit with this mindset of the cycle of improvement that we've been focusing on. Anyone else like to jump in? I see a question, Kathy, can, can you identify a pivotal moment or key decisions, individuals that helped with teacher buy-in using or creating OER? I'm advocating in our jurisdiction, but teacher buy-in seems to be a hard nut to crack. Would anyone like to jump on that? That's a really good question, Kathy. So when I speak with administrators um, and I try to explain to them why this is important work. One of the angles that I take is I, I talk about things from a financial standpoint and I talk about their budgets because what we tend to see in K-12 school districts is that about 80-85% of your district budget goes to staff. That's where your expenses are. So if you're investing that much in the people that you trust to educate your students, why wouldn't we trust them to be the content experts as well? And it comes down to empowerment. It comes down to reinforcing that message in everything that we do. So I start there with administrators. And a lot of the times they, they kind of stop and they're like, oh yeah, that's actually how much we're spending. And yes, these are our experts. It's not just that I trust them to be in the classroom and get them to get students to the point where they can take the test and do well on the test and then go to the next grade. But I expect them to be the instructional expert in that classroom. I expect them to be the content expert in that classroom. I expect them to be the discipline expert and the behavioral expert and the social emotional expert in that classroom. They need to be all of it. And if that's truly what they are, then we need to start showing them that we truly value them in those ways and talking to them in that manner as well. And sometimes just reinforcing that message with your administrators it, it's a slow burn, but if you can get them to consistently do that all the time and help to remind them that they need to share that in their messages every time they have a professional learning session with them, every time they're sending them and asking them to do a task, every time they ask them for a recommendation, remind them of the why, remind them that they want their opinion, they value their opinion, they trust them, especially right now where things can be a little more contentious. They need to hear that. And it helps with that buy-in. And then you move from the idea of buy-in to ownership. I love that, Becky. Uh, you hi highlighted so many of the difficult uh, issues of being a teacher, how challenging it is in general, how much responsibility there is. And the OER movement is really meant to empower the educator and instill trust in them to, to take on this, this role. Often of a curriculum designer, they might not have been trusted to do that prior. So here's an interesting question, um, Lee or Leah. Uh, I like seeing the needs assessment as a way to meet your constituents where they're at and like to hear more. How do you take the information captured in the assessment and build on that, that data to implement the plan? What does your workflow look like? So I think, um... It, it's important to once again acknowledge that everybody's workflow is going to look a little bit different because everybody's activity days are different and professional development days are different and teacher, you know, some teachers are going to be willing to put a lot of time and effort in outside of their contractual days. So it's important to understand that the workflow is going to look different for everyone. However, I would take that data and start by 
by by creating a, a group, basically, um, like I said, for Garnet Valley, they noticed that their social studies department was a little more ahead and a little more ready and willing. And so they took their social studies department and they started there. So you can take that data and you can just determine, okay, should this be started in just a small department or is there a, a team? Do you, Does your seventh grade middle school have a team that's ready to go um, and, and start in that kind of a process? Um, basically, you're going to have to start with your high flyers and your go-getters, um, and, and hopefully you'll have, you know, four of them to maybe one in the department that needs a little, a little encouragement along the way. Um, and then, and then just working through it in that kind of a fashion. Um, caption needs to, yeah, so that, so that's how I would determine, and I, I I'm a huge component of don't um, don't implement as you're building. Let them have time to develop and to create before you start the implementation. Um, their their first Act 80 day on August 15th shouldn't they shouldn't start you know that week with their students of trying to get this done. So making sure that they have time in the professional learning in order to get everything situated. And really, and like Becky says, always empowering them to by giving them the time to be able to implement later on. And I think going along with that workflow idea, it's also knowing what your end goal is for the work that you want to do yes. and working backwards. And so if you know where you want to end up, you can map out how you need to get there. Um, so you need to engage in a little bit of project management when you figure out that workflow. You need to know what, where you need to be, when you need to be there, and then you need to kind of work backwards to say, okay, here's everything that we need to do. We need to make sure we have the time and the resources dedicated to get there. Um, in the case of Garnet Valley, they knew that they ultimately wanted to take the work that they were doing with their social studies teachers and be able to develop two asynchronous online courses for their students. And they had a three-year plan to be able to do that. And it was a long plan for just two courses, but they got them there. And now they have an entire online school out of their district based on their work. They have an entire workflow process from the time that teachers start looking for their very first open educational resource to the time they can get an entire course completely mapped out and they have an asynchronous online offering for that course that is aligned to what they're doing in the classroom. It's very organized and very structured, which is great. But that first time that they were doing it, they gave themselves a nice big cushion to make sure that they got that flow down right because they knew what their end goal was and they shared that with the teachers. We have just a couple of minutes left. So why don't we put up the last slide that you can be sure to be able to reach us and reach the other links that we've talked about. We will also be sharing the slides and the recording. But there's a, an interesting question, if we have a minute, uh, back to you, Tracy, in the um, costs that you showed as they changed over the years, there's a question about what, uh, could you elaborate on the nature of the costs associated with OER? And Becky, I might need you to help me out with that a little bit there. Oh, you're making me think now. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the first time this became a challenge. No, it's okay. Um, if I remember correctly, um, so please don't quote me on this because I'm going to have to go back and verify, but I know that at the point when they started their work, um, uh, they were not investing anything into open educational resources at all. And then I believe that anything that was being wrapped into OER included professional development time, as well as um, time. They, they wrapped in, I believe, substitute teacher costs because they were able to pull um, teachers out of the classroom. So they had some collaborative time, but I would have to see exactly what else went into that. I'm not exactly sure. Um, they, they did at one point um, have 
some outside professional development that they brought in some people to help them guide as well. And so there were costs for that associated with OER um, just to make sure that they were doing everything appropriately in the first few years of their implementation, but then those costs went away and I think everything else moved straight into staffing costs for them, but I'm not 100% certain of that. Right, thank you. There's a lot of great comments in the chat, but I'll just uh, touch on there are takeaways that uh, we emphasize today that the, this work supported by the guide is really meant to empower leaders and educators in the work they're already doing and to be comprehensive in their approach. There's multiple points of entry and ways to tailor this to your own needs. And OER-based professional learning has a lot of benefits. Investing in educators and showing that you trust your educators is really at the center of success of instructional initiatives that include OER. Uh, and really can re help reallocate funding to be beneficial instead of purchasing proprietary materials. So let's just put up our, our contact info there um, and be respectful of time. If you have to leave, we really thank you so much for being here. Uh, we can stay on another couple of minutes. If you have burning questions, we're, we're happy to, to address them, but thank you so much. Find us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, our newsletter, and our hub, and our email. So there's lots of ways to continue this work and, and be back always in touch. Thank you.